Thank you. Thanks, Rusty. Um, so most of this stuff I'll talk about uh, was mostly initiated and done by a major in power who already has his uh, new lab at UCSD, and then Amandinche, who is in the audience, with a lot of help from uh, Hepley, and these are our collaborators. So if uh, you were lucky and you went to bed around 9 or 10 last night, then maybe your deep sleep happened around 2 o'clock in the morning, and in anticipation of uh, waking up, your body temperature began to rise, and then as soon as you opened your eyes, had a lot of light coming through, then melatonin level dropped, cortisol level began to rise, and then your maximum alertness happened uh, right when Rob was talking, and uh, then muscle performance peaks around this time. And then as um, we prepare for bed, your melatonin levels begin to rise, uh, core body temperature goes down. And if we think carefully about this uh, chart, then the three pillars of health that we think, sleep, nutrition, and physical activity, are essentially coordinated by the circadian timing system. And in that way, circadian timing system has a very profound higher level impact on coordinating tissue-specific gene expression with timing information to create rhythms that actually help us to go through our daily, daily cycles in a uh, predictable way. And in the uh, field, we have been drawing different kind of charts to figure out how this system works, how we are synchronized to outside light. For example, light received through a specialized set of uh, retinal ganglion cells that uh, are sensitive to mostly blue light that we discovered almost uh, 15 years ago, entrains the master clock in the brain. And then this bre these 20,000 neurons in suprachiasmatic nucleus uh, send both indirect, direct projections and also synap and diffusible factors to coordinate or orchestrate um, gene expression, rhythmic gene expression in multiple different organs, which also have their own circadian clock. So this one-way centric view of light uh, going through the brain and orchestrating gene expression has changed, again, almost uh, seven, eight years ago. Uh, we um, and others published a series of papers showing that when we change our eating time, then that can completely override the connection from light to peripheral clock. Instead, now food can directly regulate gene expression and um, rhythmic transcription in all these peripheral clocks. So that prompted us to think of a different model. Is there, how, how, can, how can food affect all this? And is there another axis so that uh, food signals can go to the brain? So then we started thinking of, again, coming up with a different paradigm. So we are thinking that diet and eating fasting rhythm will change the gut environment on a rhythmic fashion. For example, gut pH, gut composition will change uh, when we eat or fast. And that, in turn, can change uh, the gut microbiome composition and also its transcriptome, metatranscriptome, uh, which will correlate with gut metabolism. Gut metabolites will be changing or secreted in a rhythmic fashion, or gut hormones should change in a rhythmic fashion, or even the levels can just go up and high, in a, uh, high or low in a chronic fashion uh, that can affect metabolic tissues, and uh, which, in turn, uh, can change uh, gut environment. For example, uh, bile acids and few other factors that come from metabolic tissues to uh, guts can also change. In addition, these two can signal to the brain, and then brain can have a higher level um, signal to eating pattern by generating a daily rhythms in hunger and satiety. Um, so in that way, we started to think, well, uh, how do we dissect each of these and then ask how diet or eating fasting pattern can affect um, metabolism and overall health. Uh, so uh, we went back to uh, some basic stuff that is already done 11,000 times, and that is, uh, people have shown that um, if you give mice a standard diet versus a high-fat diet, then mice on high-fat diet become obese and diabetic within 9 to 12 weeks. And uh, there are a lot of other comorbidities that also happen. But if we look carefully about the eating pattern, mice on high-fat diet Mice and normal chow usually eat somewhere between 65 to 85 percent of their food during night time in different vivariums. And accordingly, they have a very robust rhythm in gene expression in liver and many other metabolic organs, whereas mice on high-fat diet uh, equally split their uh, calories between day and night, and that leads to dampened rhythm of most of the 
transcripts that usually cycle in uh, normal child condition. So then a few years ago, we had a very simple question, how much of this uh, health deterioration is due to high fat diet or uh, due to timing of feeding? So in a simple experiment, we gave access to full, uh, same amount of calories from the same nutrition source, high fat diet, that uh, the mice could either eat at levitum or in a time-restricted fashion within eight hours, nine hours, 10 or 12 hours. And uh, the bottom line is after 18 weeks, uh, those mice as expected were obese, and these mice surprisingly were 28%, uh, they were 28% less, and most of this loss in body weight is due to change in adiposity. And we also see the telltale sign because the liver is laden with fat here, and there is no fat in the liver of these mice. And uh, people always ask, did they eat the same number of calories? Yes, they did. And they also had almost equivalent amount of activity in the first nine to 10 weeks of the experiment. And um, we saw quite a lot of benefits. Uh, those two benefits I told you about, and then blood sugar, blood cholesterol, decreased energy expenditure goes up, motor coordination and endurance goes up. And then um, uh, Amandine and Amir kind of went back and asked a lot of different questions with uh, more than 500 different mice, uh, asking whether this is specific to only high fat diet or different types of diet. So high fat, high sucrose, or um, high fructose also, or whether it's nine hours, 12, uh, 12 hours, 15 hours, um, or five days of time restricted, two days of early leave. Um, and then also the crossover experiments. So the bottom line was timing of food intake really determined um, the health of the organism irrespective of nutrition quality and quantity. So in that way, we can actually rewrite what nutritionists have been telling in addition to what and how much people eat when they eat uh, might also have a huge impact on metabolism. So that was mostly done by Amir and Amandine. At the same time, we had another question, that is, uh, is some of the benefits of TRF, or time restricted feeding, imparted by the gut microbiome? And this is where I um, really dug deep and then looked at what happened. So our primary hypothesis was there are cyclical changes in the gut microbiome due to cyclical nature of feeding and fasting in normal chow fed mice, and then in diet-induced obesity or in high-fat diet, uh, since mice eat all the time, then the gut um, um, environment doesn't change much, so it might change those, it might obliterate those cyclical changes and TRF might restore those changes. And by that time, a lot of people had already published uh, what, what are the differences between a normal chow fed mice and high fat diet fed mice with respect to their compositional change in gut microbiome. So that gave us a very uh, specific reference question to ask. So when Amir repeated this experiment, uh, he found uh, again the same thing. The time-restricted fed mice, high-fat time-restricted, high-fat ad lib, these two are the high-fat fed group, and this is normal chow ad lib fed group. And over six to seven weeks, as expected, the time-restricted fed mice were completely protected from weight gain, and they also have pretty good glucose response. And then he extracted the cecal content or cecal microbiome and then asked whether, the, whether there are compositional changes between these three groups. So normal chow fed mice, which have a rhythm and gene, gene sorry, uh, feeding, um, they essentially showed nearly 17% of the microbiome was cycling. And uh, the major um, um, classes, bacteriodities, formicutes, and vericomicrobia, they all um, show very characteristic oscillations going up and down when the mice feed or fast. Whereas in high fed or leaf fed mice, as expected, uh, we also saw uh, almost flattening of these rhythms. There is no diurnal rhythm and compositional changes in major phyla. And surprisingly, when mice were fed in a time-restricted fashion, which protects them against diabetes, obesity, and all these diseases, we also saw no major changes. They saw the microbial composition remains flat. And that was kind of surprising because that um, refuted their basic hypothesis, but at the same time, it gave us more opportunity to dug, dig deep and ask what else actually happened. So if you look at the uh, diversity of um, the microbiome, in when mice eat normal chow in this PCA analysis, so it's interesting to see that when mice eat normal chow, their composition actually changes on a daily basis, whereas on high-fat diet, the composition doesn't change throughout the day-night cycle. And some of the examples are here. Some, some um, 
uh, some elements to change upon fasting or some upon feeding and then um, some change with respect to response to diet because these two groups of mice actually the same high fat diet whether are libitum or time restricted they have the same composition so that also gave us more um, leg room to actually go see uh, which uh, uh, subphylum level um, microbiomes were changing and some of the examples are here and then the big question was these changes might happen but what is the impact on metabolism why how does it correlate with what happens in the gut so then we went back to the gut uh, metabolome and asked how does the metabolites change particularly in cecum because that's almost the um, very end of uh, the digestive system and that will give us some clue so for example, in mice, complex sugars are never broken down by the host enzymes. Uh, the microbial enzymes break them down to xylose and galactose. And then we asked whether the microbial changes affect this um, change in uh, simple sugars. Actually, what was interesting was, in although these two groups of mice had the same diet and they also had the same overall composition, um, what was really amazing, what was surprising was the simple sugars were much higher in high fat time restricted fed mice. So that means the complex sugars are broken down maybe at the wrong part of the digestive system where there are not enough transporters to absorb the glucose so the glucose is excreted. So in that way the micro, so eating fasting rhythm somehow changes uh, the gut microbiome function so that uh, sugar, some sugar is not absorbed. And second thing that we that also popped out was uh, the time restricted fed mice actually had more primary, secondary, and conjugated bile acids. And uh, bile acids are emerging as another uh, master regulator of metabolism by acting on multiple different organs. So they can act on the gut, they are produced in the liver, and also excess bile acids can go to brown fat and can act through TGR5 pathway to uh, change uncoupling protein expression. So in that way, this become really very interesting systemic signals that can be modulated both by the microbiome and also by the host. So um, then the question, um, another question that Amir had was why there are not many um, microbial changes in this uh, uh, regimen? So we wanted to ask um, what are the metatranscriptome changes? Maybe the microbiome is not changing, but the transcripts are changing. And uh, so that's why uh, we went back to, again, drawing, um, drawing room and then asked, okay, so let's take the DNA out and then the RNA out of the sequel content and then sequence both of them and ask what happens to the metatranscriptome. And uh, what is interesting is uh, if we take the metatranscriptome, again, the challenge is how do you map this? There will be gazillion different, uh, different genes. So we did mostly pathway-centric annotations. So that means we took the entire metatranscriptome and asked what are the different um, enzymes or uh, proteins with non-enzymatic uh, activities that are found and then ask which uh, pathways they map to. So essentially we find uh, nearly 5,000 different uh, enzymatic pathways or different pathways that uh, we could map to and um, most of them are enriched in the normal chow fed mice and they're actually the diversity and also diversity of metatranscriptome goes down in high fat or lip fed mice and that comes back in time restricted fed mice. So this is, uh, now if we take this uh, pathway centric um, analysis and then ask how many pathways actually cycle in normal chow fed mice or ad lib fed mice, high fat ad lib fed mice, this is very small, but under time restricted feeding condition, almost 13% of the um, metatranscriptome begins to cycle. So now we can uh, dig deep and ask, okay, so what are the different um, transcripts uh, from the microbiome that are actually cycling, and these are, these are the correlogram plots, so that means uh, it essentially shows at different time what is the composition of this uh, metatranscriptome and how does it correlate with uh, another time. And as you can see, there are some variations between day and night, and most of those variations is due to during the daytime when mice usually don't eat much. So feeding and fasting definitely has huge impact on this uh, metatranscriptome. And whereas in high fat or lip fed mice, where mice actually eat continuously, you don't see much difference between day and night. Whereas under time restricted fed condition, this is where most of the changes come up. So we see a huge change in metatranscriptome, but as you can remember, there was not much change in the metagenome. 
So now, uh, from here, we can go back and ask, so what are the pathways that are actually changing at the transcriptome level? And uh, two things that come up that really correlate with what we had seen before. That is, um, cellulose degradation pathways now begin to cycle very robustly under time-restricted feeding, and also the bile acid uh, degradation pathway. So in that way, we can begin to now connect some of these, and Amir is going to uh, continue probing this at a more mechanistic level in his lab. So in summary, from this study, what we find is the gut microbiome and also the metatranscriptome does oscillate on a daily basis to adapt to the changing uh, nature of the gut environment and under high fat or libitum condition, when mice eat continuously, then that cyclical changes is uh, obliterated and time-restricted feeding can bring back some of those rhythms. So in that way, we can begin to ask how diet and eating fasting pattern affect this pipeline of signaling. At the same time, we can ask another thing, that is, what is the role of the microbiome itself? If we completely remove the microbiome from the equation, then what happens to uh, the whole equation? So um, on the same time, there are many people who have done these experiments where you can keep the mice in, uh, in notobiotic facility in germ-free condition and give them high-fat diet uh, mostly high lactose, uh, high milk protein diet where, uh, sorry, milk fat diet where mice are getting 37 to 40 percent of fat from milk fat. And surprisingly, mice actually don't get obese. And they don't have any telltale sign of high fat diet induced obesity in those not facilities. facility. So then there are additional questions. Maybe the immune system is not developing well and there might be some developmental changes that are happening in the gut. So that's why um, Amir thought, okay, so let's uh, do an acute antibiotic microbial depletion. So in that way, we can, get, we can, we can take care of all the uh, developmental changes that might have ch happened in um, notobiotic facility, and then ask what happens to luminal signaling. So um, in this experiment, we acclimatize the mice to the uh, diet condition for four to eight weeks, and then we give them this um, oral gavaz actually twice a day. Uh, so it's a lot of work, a lot of mice, and that was also done for almost um, two to three weeks. Um, so then in this experiment, uh, what is interesting is uh, the mice actually um, eat the same number of calories, their body weight doesn't change, and um, their body composition doesn't change. We can actually deplete a vast majority of microbiome in the um, triple antibiotics treat treated mice. And um, immediately within a couple of weeks, we can see that the uh, colon is distended. There is a, the colon is really big, and the sickle weight is also big. And uh, then uh, they also have a higher level of stool output. But what is really interesting is this, that if we give, um, if we do a oral glucose tolerance test that uh, most people get uh, if they have suspected diabetes, then mice usually rise their glucose within 30 minutes and then they go back to normal, whereas mice that are treated with antibiotics, uh, their glucose level doesn't budge at, as if they actually don't see any glucose. So this was really surprising because we had never seen that uh, you can make this glucose level flat. So initially, um, we thought that somebody didn't do the experiment well, and <laughs> we had to change people, but we all, always find the same um, result. What was interesting was the insulin sensitivity did not change in the insulin tolerance test, but the postprandial insulin actually was pretty high. Uh, so then we started to think, what are the gut signaling that can affect postprandial insulin? And um, uh, to step back, there are a few other things that we also saw. So for example, the butyrate, uh, which is mostly broken down from complex carb, uh, complex fat by the gut microbiome, was almost absent. So that means in these um, mice, there is not much butyric acid, which is a fuel for the gut cells, uh, the host cells. And second one was there was um, increase in this um, bile acid, uh, tarocolate. And, um, then we went back and asked what happened to gut hormones, particularly GLP-1, which is an incretin. It helps to produce more insulin from pancreas. Both GLP-1 and uh, the active form of GLP actually goes up pretty high, and that correlates w well with a uh, few of its effects. And this is the uh, transcription of the uh, gene, and then that's the, the GIP ghrelin don't change too much, and then some other uh, gut hormones do change. 
So then the question is, if GLP-1 is the cause for this increase in uh, insulin response and very nice glucose response, if we put an antagonist of GLP-1 function, then can we recover uh, the response? Then the answer is partially yes. So that means in addition to GLP-1, there might be addition to other facet to the story. Um, but the GLP expression, GLP change is very accurate. Within three days of antibiotic treatment, we can see a huge change, big increase in GLP-1. And some of the other um, gut hormone changes also happen very quickly within three to four days. And uh, this is, again, another aspect that Amir is going to follow up in his lab. But one thing we wanted to ask, what happens to the host uh, gut um, in response to this acute change in micro microbial function? And when we do the RNA expression profile of the host, then what we find is there is a remodeling of uh, metabolism in the gut. So uh, to make this very simple is since the enterocytes are not getting their usual food, that's butyrate, they switch to using glucose. So in that way, the gut becomes a huge glucose sink. And, and we think that that's what is partially um, taking care of the flat glucose response that we see. And in Addison, another thing that's happening is, although there is a lot of bile acids in the gut, there is also increase in bile acid transporter on both sides of the enterocyte, so that bile acid is absorbed and also secreted into the um, general circulation. And in the liver, we also see uptake of bile acids more, and that somehow reduces the inhibitor of SIP, uh, of CYP7A, which actually helps bile acid production from uh, cholesterol. So in that way, the mouse kind of goes into this bile acid production mode, almost like a positive feedback loop. Now, the question is, can this bile acid, the primary bile acid, TCA, account for GLP-1 production? So in this very simple experiment, if we just put, if Amir just puts oral gavas of tyrocholate, then very quickly we can see within very few days the GLP-1 expression goes up. So in that way, uh, he's trying to now connect how GLP-1 connects, uh, sorry, how uh, bile acid metabolism affect GLP. So once, uh, while we can stare at this model all the time, um, and it's becoming clear that in addition to gut and liver and brain, there may be additional organs involved. Uh, there is also dynamic aspects of this. Uh, then the big question is, how do we understand uh, the whole dynamic of the entire system? Uh, we don't have a system very close to human, like he, mice are not an ideal circadian system for humans because mice are nocturnal, they produce melatonin when they're awake, we produce melatonin when, when we sleep. So a few years ago, almost 10 years ago, we uh, thought, okay, we should try to do something in primates. So in collaboration with Howard Cooper in INSERM, who has a secondary lab in IPR, Institute of Primate Resource in Nairobi, Kenya, which is a, that's a World Health Organization Institute, um, we uh, went there. And after a lot of different um, uh, legal things and permits, et cetera, we wanted to test uh, what happens to um, both tissue-specific and temporal gene expression profile in a non-human primate. So we selected Papuanovis, which is baboon, because baboon is a pest in Kenya, and IPR has a huge colony of baboon, and they periodically call the colony just to maintain it. Uh, so it was a good collaboration. So, um, so far in mice, for example, people have looked at maximum 10 or 12 different organs uh, gene expression profile over a day. And since it was a once in a lifetime, very unique experiment, we wanted to make sure that we take every care to capture a lot of different tissues. So total, we had nearly 6,000 different vials of tissues. And also we serial section the brain digitized, punched, and hemisected. So we have one set of brain here. If anybody wants to take any chunk of brain from a specific region of any non-human primate, you're welcome. So essentially we had 64 different tissues. And uh, 12 different time points. We also have complete control over this experiment, so we know their activity. We had a um, health sensor that was implanted into the animal, so we are called continuously collecting uh, body temperature. The food was regulated, so we have a um, pretty good idea about these uh, animals. So uh, we collected 12 different uh, time points. The bottom line is nearly 45% of the genome in a primate oscillates in at least one brain region out of 22 that we probed. 
and nearly 65% of the primate genome oscillates in at least one tissue. So this is the largest ever known described gene regulatory system that's layered over uh, uh, tissue-specific gene expression. For example, now if we do correlograms of special gene expression profiles, so these are the brain tissues and these are different di types of tissues, uh, this is the type of correlation you see between tissues, and if we do the same correlogram between corresponding tissues, then we get a completely different picture. So that means the overlap of gene expression between any two different tissues doesn't predict uh, what is the overlap of um, cycling genes between those tissues. Uh, and this is also shown here. For example, these are 64 different tissues. All these genes here, nearly 10,800 of them, are shared. So that means 10,800 genes are expressed in all 64 primate organs, but only a small fraction of them are cycling, and only uh, two or three genes cycle in more than 50 organs. If we look at the uh, type of genes, I will not actually go into the type, but if you look at the peak maximum number of genes that cycle in any given phase, so this is dark, that's light, you can see there is a huge variability in which phase the clock is running in different organs. So these are just different organs and then their peak phase of expression of different genes. And even in the gut tissue, if we take these eight different tissues from oesophagus to cecum, then we can see that the gene expression is extremely different in different set of uh, organs and also there is very little overlap between them. So with that actually I will stop because this is a very exciting, almost it took us 10 years to produce this map and then to dig deep and then take some of these clues and go back to humans and ask, okay, so based on this hypothesis, can we see when humans change diet or eating pattern or go through sleep deprivation or go through physical exercise, et cetera, how does the system change and can we learn something from here? Thank you. So that's a tricky question because we are not mapping the transcript to a species first. We are just taking the bulk. So we cannot say now which, um, from which species this transcript is coming. So in, in, in that last study, um, I'm trying to get you to unpack that just a little bit. You yeah. did it abruptly before we had the, what, help, help us with the take home message. So the take-home message is um, a few. One is more than 50% of our genome oscillates, and most of the oscillations is tissue-specific. Um, then the so how many how many primates did you measure, and over what time, just as a review? Okay, so there are, there are 12 animals, okay. and uh, in every two hours, samples are collected from one animal. So there. Mm -hmm. So in some way, it's also very different from what has been done in mice. Uh, most of the mouse studies are, mice are homozygous, homogeneous. Here, all the animals are genetically unrelated, and they are heterozygous. So in that way, what we are seeing here is very close to what we may And this, this was taken over a 24-hour period of time? So yeah. Both, and is their circadian cycle similar? Yeah, so their cortisol cycle is very similar to human cortisol cycle. The melatonin is similar to human melatonin cycle. And the activity rest cycle is also very similar. Um, in the sense, they have deep sleep maybe for seven to eight hours, and then they're kind of in a REM sleep towards the end of the night. Um, then their social structure is also very similar to human, mostly they're mostly monogamous and... Were they all the same gender or was there... They were the same gender uh, and they were six to eight year old. Mm -hmm. So their diet constant? Or... So their diet was, um, they had a big breakfast in the morning, um, one and a half hour after lights on. And then they had uh, a big lunch around 2 o'clock, and then they had a small fruit snack around 3.30 in the afternoon. So essentially, they were eating all their food within seven and a half hour. And the 
cages where the food was cleaned up around 4 o'clock, so they didn't have any access to food after 4. And the lights turned off around 6. Another big difference is these were in semi-natural conditions, so they had some diffuse access to light just like our windows, but they do, did have electric lighting that maintained at uh, 150 lux. That also um, meant that they were going through a, they were experiencing environmental temperature cycle, which in Nairobi in uh, September was around 10 degrees centigrade, um, day-night differences in temperature. So would you imagine, I mean, uh, is this a, a population that you can do experiments with? So what happens if you give them ad libitum? Because uh, you've got this combined situation, yeah. you could actually do the primate experiment that you yeah. did in mouse and ask whether or not, if you give them ad living when they can eat over 24 hour period of time, yeah. what happens to their... Yeah, so that's a very great question historically also, because if you look at uh, primate diet-induced obesity model, you never see that because most primate labs all over the world feed their primates in the same schedule. Yeah. Uh, they actually feed all their food within six and a half to seven and a half hours. And we know from mouse experiment, if you give them high fat diet, they won't become fat. And that's what people had seen and they rarely published. We're actually collaborating with the uh, Wake Forest Primate Research Center where they have done the experiment now. Yeah, yeah so we, had, we did the first experiment where the high fat diet was given at libitum and we can clearly replicate human obesity, diabetes, and metabolic disease in primate, and that happens very quickly in older animals, older macaques, but not in younger macaques. Younger macaques take slightly longer time. Then the converse experiment that you just suggested, putting them on TRF, we just started that um, two months ago. It will be a one-year experiment. There are 100 plus animals, both young and old, male and female, going through the three different four different diets. Is there, is the there epidemiology data on, on humans with regards to this? Eating so time. They have to be self-report yeah. yeah. of uh, eating over a 24-hour period, restricted periods, or just regional, continental, you know? Yeah. Actually, um, American Heart Association did a very extensive review on eating pattern, fasting, and meal frequency and uh, they just released a scientific statement in January saying that at least, um, so they reviewed almost more than 100 different uh, clinical studies and epidemiological studies. One problem is uh, most dietitians don't ask when you eat, they ask what did you eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So in that way it's really hard to extrapolate, but their bottom line is they now suggest that eating all your food during certain fixed hour during daytime and having a prolonged overnight fast is good based on some of the historical data. So that's why we are doing a large study where we're looking at eating pattern and health um, all over the, all over US and now they gave us permission to do it all over the world. And in that way, maybe we'll have power to look at this correlation. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.